G'day there, my name is James Baldwin and welcome to another episode of Extreme E's official podcast, Off Track. In this episode, we chat with Andretti United's Katie Munnings. And I'm joined, as always, by my friend and yours. The friendship does continue. It's Michael Laminato. G'day, mate. <laughs> yes, yeah, at least for one more race. Then we'll see. <laughs> How are you doing? I look forward to my performance review for the end of the season <laughs> just to see the friendship key performance indicator. Was I any good? Uh, I've introduced you as my friend for so many times. So surely that's just how it works, isn't it? Yeah, well, look, you've definitely met at least one or two of the objectives, and now we'll see if we make it to the end. But look, I don't want to preempt any reviews. That would be silly. And we don't want to preempt the end of the championship either. We've still no, got such true. a beautiful build up to the thing. Can't wait oh. to see how it's going to go. Look, I'm still getting over Sardinia, to be honest. Uh, a mm. wonderful, wonderful weekend worth of racing. And if you haven't yet listened to our preview and post race podcasts, please go and do that. We spoke with Andrew Coley, one of the commentators of Extreme E, of course, ahead of the Sardinia race and afterwards we spoke at length about all of the teams and all of our thoughts. It was a great podcast to be honest, one of my favourites that we've done all year, Michael. But before this weekend, we or that weekend I should say, we spoke with Katie Munnings from Andretti United which was a fantastic chat uh, and as you said in the last podcast, we spoke at a slightly happier time for her. Yeah, it's a beautiful thing because she just won uh, in Greenland. So the mood is very upbeat as opposed to the, let's say, less good weekend they had <laughs> in Italy. That's all I'll say about that. Listen to the review podcast if you want to know why it was less good. Uh, but she was in a great mood, of course, having won that. Uh, everything looked like it was coming up and Andretti really United. Uh, and look, it still is to a degree. They're still, of course, very talented races. And I fully expect them to be back in the frame for the last round. But she was in a great mood. And I thought what was really interesting, we talk about this in the chat, is that, of course, in this field, we've got such a mix of drivers from different backgrounds, but also a mix of ages. And she's, of course, on the very much younger end of this spectrum. So it was great to talk to her about her perspective about motorsport and, of course, the climate challenge coming from well, a much younger age demographic. It's a fantastic chat. Let's get into it with our chat with Andretti United's Katie Munnings. It's our great pleasure to welcome to Extreme E Off Track from Andretti United Extreme E, just to get the name in twice, it's Katie Munnings. How are you doing? Hello, I'm great. How are you guys? Doing really well. Oh. It's a, I should have said, sorry, I really should have said uh, race winner now, uh, Katie yes. Munnings, because that surely becomes, when you've only got five races, surely you have to make sure you mention that as frequently as possible. Mm. We'll get to that race a little bit later on, but first of all, <laughs> Do just tell us, to be a race winner now with only five races, it must be a pretty cool feeling in this first season of all seasons. Yeah, it is really cool. Um, when me and Timmy were on the podium in the first race, we were so happy with that. Um, and then to win in, in Greenland was so cool. When you look at the teams that we're up against, it's, it's not an easy field at all. So it felt really special. And actually, I think it was Greenland's first ever big sport event either, the, the locals were saying. So they were, they, I think they were really happy to have us there. So the whole atmosphere at the end was really special. Well, you yeah, can fly the Greenland flag now as well, I suppose. Maybe you can be Greenland's Katie Buddings. <laughs> <laughs> Look, I'd take it, to be honest. I mean, I think they were as excited as you were on the podium in Greenland as well. That was some, some mega scenes. Well, before we talk more about Extreme E, I know it's an Extreme E podcast, but let's talk about you some more, shall we? Let's go back right to your beginning because... Motorsport obviously uh, is a big part of your life now, but talk to us about what got you into that and what was your first experience with motorsport? Do you know what? I don't really remember my first experience. I guess my first experience was I was in a, I was in a motorsport family, not a competing family from that sense. Um, my dad used to be a rally driver, but he never really had the budget to do it properly. So he was a he was kind of head instructor at Brands um, and the London Rally Schools when I was growing up. So I guess... Actually, I think before that, he he actually started this motorsport entertainment company, which was like quad bikes wow. and Honda Pilots and things like that. And awesome. I remember, well, I don't remember, but I've been told quite a few times since that when I was two, he sat me on this quad bike um, and it was like, it was in his yard. He was 
loading it on and I was like I want to get on it I want to get on it dad so I was obsessed with growing up sooner than like how old I was my sister was older and I just wanted to be older all the time so I wanted to do grown up things <laughs> and I remember I, I jumped on this quad bike and um, he said okay so he was going to take me through the instructions he said so this is the um, this makes it go if you press that with your thumb it will go and I just went like that like full open it wasn't restricted or anything like full open so he grabs the handlebar to try and catch me to stop me and it's completely as you can imagine just pulling one handlebar on a quad it just flicks flicks me and I just went I like did a 90 degree turn and went straight through my neighbor's garage like smashed through his garage door. <laughs> that was oh, no. my first crash I was two on a quad bike <laughs> so we are the rest of history we've been crashing since <laughs> Oh, it's good to get just, the first one out of the way. I exactly. Suppose. Get the fear out of the way right at the beginning and just bloody go for it for the rest of it. I love it. Exactly. No so, fear. <laughs> so, I mean, uh, growing up in a motorsport family, I guess, explains a lot of that. But I, the logical question, I suppose, is that because not everyone who grows up in a motorsport family necessarily has to take it up. Was there ever a point in your life where you felt like motorsport wasn't going to be your story? Or, oh, I mean, two years old is a pretty, pretty good sign, I suppose. <laughs> yeah. I mean, to be honest, it was never even when I was sort of 17, I didn't think I'd be in motorsport. Because I didn't know, it was, like, to be honest with you, I really didn't know it was a career. You know, you see Formula One drivers and you think, okay, that's like, you know, mm. something quite unique, special. They've all been karting since they were eight. But I never realized that in other forms of motorsport, you could build a career out of it. So for me, it was always something where I'd go to school and I wanted to be a vet school. So I was working really hard at school to try and get the grades. And I'd come home and then, um, you know, they'd be having these big events on at this family farm where I live. So I'd just be literally like in my school uniform, helping dad, he'd have a quad bike broken down. I'd be like jumping on it, trying to fix it. Um, and uh, it was always kind of a hobby for me, a bit of a stress relief, um, a weekend thing that I loved. Um, I was never sort of training or in driver development or anything like that. I was just literally getting in cars that could be in the scrapyard and and trying to do handbrake turns in them in the garden like it was <laughs> pretty uh, pretty <laughs> basic the sort of thing that I was doing um and then when I was I think when I, we were when I was 14 um I started grass auto testing with my sister which is like a kind of slalom um car development skill kind of thing and it was because where we went to school it was a 45 minute drive and the lanes were really um slippery in the in the winter they don't get iced it's quite in the countryside where I live so my dad was saying I'm not having any daughter of mine under steering off into the ditch she doesn't have to drive on ice sort of thing so he wanted to get us on wet grass to kind of show us this car control side of things but I was incredibly competitive so as soon as I entered into that I just kept wanting to be better and better um and then when I was 17 um I think I had the opportunity to test a rally car with Peugeot for the first time which was in Mont Blanc um in France and I it was completely in at the deep end because I hadn't done any sort of club rallying that no I hadn't driven a rally car I was 17 so I just basically got my license in the UK to drive on the road and suddenly we turned up at this test and I think there was like some of the top drivers in the world there they were kind of trying out for the Peugeot Rally Academy for the next year and I was there and I'd never driven left-hand drive so I'm in a left-hand drive rally car that's like the, the, the junior category for the world championships is a proper like you know it's got some power behind it um, and I didn't speak French um, and the guy that was coaching <laughs> me he was the French champion so he was he didn't speak English uh, so he was just sort of tapping my leg when I should accelerate and break and um, I just remember it being I was I did my first run and I was so overwhelmed I was like wow this is so fast this is so cool and I got up to the top and he was like um Bearing in mind, this is like a really tiny, this is a stupid road to test on. <laughs> it was a really <laughs> tiny kind of gravel, uh, broken up, literally off the side of the mountains. If you just go, you're just going to keep going. Yeah. Uh, it really, um, it was the kind of road we drove up and we thought, no, that can't be the road. This must just be like an entrance road <laughs> to the like, you know, safe area to test, but it wasn't. We got back up after my first run and I was like, oh, that was so cool. And he said, right, so do you want to put it in stage mode now then? And I'd been literally driving in road <laughs> section mode and I was <laughs> so happy with it. So <laughs> I think that was a really humbling moment in my life. But um, he, <laughs> it kind of, it spurred me on because then I was like addicted to the challenge of how can he drive like that? I want to drive like that. It just opened up a new level of uh, kind of what was cool when I was 17. And that was it. I was really hooked on motorsport. I want to take you back to something you were saying just a bit earlier, the idea that, I mean, you were still obviously in school, kids go up to school to a certain age, but often you hear that, you know, aspiring racers eventually give it up, they drop it and they either, sometimes they'll be homeschooled on the road or sometimes they'll just, they'll give it up entirely. You went through to your final year exams, I think I'm right in saying, so you pretty much finished the whole high school situation. But in fact, you finished your final year exams while you were also competing and rallying literally at the very same time, the same week. Tell us, first of all, the experience of doing those two things at once, because I can't imagine anything more different than one day sitting an exam and then 
racing a rally car. And what was the decision making for that? Because surely by that point, you could have probably guessed you were going somewhere with the cars. Oh, it was stupid. It was completely stupid. Um, it was one of those things that seems like a good idea. And then when you get to it, you're like, oh God, I've really screwed this up. Um, it was, I, was doing, I was trying to sit my biology because as I mentioned, I wanted to be a vet. So all of my A-levels were sort of chemistry, mm. biology, um, quite hard subjects to just try and wing it in the exams. And um, I remember I had, it was EPA rally. So it was my first round. So after after I'd done this test, we kind of came up with this idea and um, with Peugeot in the UK, they put some budget in and we were like, right, let's go and do the European Championship because cost-wise it was the same really to do the national championship here or go to Europe where exposure was better, the roads were better, drivers were better. So everything mm. about it, I thought I'd improve a lot faster. I was a novice going in, but I didn't really care about that. I just wanted to learn. <laughs> um, and so that was actually the first round was EPA rally. That was going to be the first round yeah. of the European Championship that I was going to enter and it turned out that it was literally in the middle of my exam so I think I had so I hadn't really driven the car before so I had a pre-event test on I can't remember the exact days but it was something like um, on the Tuesday and I completely destroyed the car like on the first run so I went um, I was basically driving I think actually that, that champion the French champion was with me again he was kind of trying to drive a coach me but where I was going from right hand drive to left hand drive in in um, Europe obviously as you do um, in the in the rally cars my wheel placement was a little bit out I don't know if you've ever jumped into the car on the other side if you picked up a higher mm-hmm. car and you're a little bit like you always feel like you're going to hit the <laughs> oncoming traffic for a bit yeah. it was like that in the rally car and I, I literally just got my wheels like that far out of place on the grass on the side and it was really wet rainy day and it just spun me but it was like a consequential spin because I hit um, and my front end went into the ditch but then there was like a bridge so I hit that flipped and then took out like a big electricity pylon and it ended up being quite Ooh, a lot of damage to the car so the team basically had to rebuild the car overnight but the next morning literally the next morning I had my biology A level in England so <laughs> this is Belgium now so I'm in Belgium I drive back 45 minutes I get on the Euro tunnel under under the sea back to the England I take my biology A-, A level the next morning the team are fixing the car and that afternoon I had shakedown <laughs> for the rally so they built the car overnight <laughs> and I'm sitting in my biology A level exam like completely shaken up so I've just like totaled a car for the first time <laughs> and um, try. I, I remember just seeing the exam was like a bit of rest period I had like an hour and a half where I was sat down like nobody was like <laughs> contact me I remember it was just quite chill and then um, I went and I had to do shakedown that afternoon so it took me like two hours to get back across to Belgium and then we were in the car at like two o'clock in the afternoon or something like that so but, and then we went into the rally and we finished it was all good but yeah looking back on it it was like don't do that if anyone's watching and they're going to do their final year exams it's good. make sure you do them in like without having a race week around it <laughs> But hang on a second. I want to know, how did the exam go after all of that? Because if you <laughs> thought that was relaxing. <laughs> how is your <laughs> vet career? <laughs> well, as you can tell, I didn't make it to here, right? <laughs> so, mm, not so good. I dropped a grade. Yeah, I did drop a grade because of it, but I was, I took it, you know, I was like, that is yeah. fine with me. Yeah, you sound very disappointed by it for sure. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, look, Katie, I mean, you're one of the youngest drivers on the circuit, really, aren't you, from a rallying point of view, and if, certainly from an extreme A point of view, which will talk to a little bit later on of course but as you mentioned there you jump straight across to Europe uh, and as you also said there's a lot of you know competition there there's a lot of history there of young drivers and uh, slightly older drivers of course doing very very well what was it like for you and doing the A-levels as well but what was it like for you then sort of after that period being one of the youngest drivers was it an accepting culture for you or did you find it very difficult to sort of assimilate into that period? I think it was, um, my experience personally was always great. I mean, I'm not talking about like online or any, you know, anything out of your control, but I mean like in the service Mm. paddock, in the area where like the people, my support team around me, my family, also the other drivers were really accepting of having me in there. I think they realized that there was no girls or really there wasn't a lot of girls. So they were quite encouraging. Uh, You should share their onboards and stuff like that with me of rallies coming up. And um, I had a great co-driver who was kind of well connected as well in the, in the field. So she used to get me a lot of support through other drivers. So um, it was a really positive experience the whole way through for me, which was really um, cool. Um, I know everyone always asks the question as well of being a girl in rally, what was that like? But really I didn't, it didn't feel any different because, uh, you know, I don't know any different. And it was just sort of, I was kind of accepted by the guys and it was really cool. Um, Obviously I was complete novice, so I wasn't really much of a threat. So I don't think any, there wasn't, there wasn't too much 
mental stability there. Um, as I got faster and faster, maybe the support from others became less and less. But overall, it was a really, you know, it was a nice atmosphere. Um, and I, yeah, I still keep forgetting that I'm still quite young. Like when I speak to the other drivers and extremely, I always think I'm the same age as them. But some of them have got like, you know, quite a few years on me. So sometimes it's really important for me from my side because I'm so competitive and so, you know, driven by um, kind of now motorsport success and wanting to be faster all the time. And I haven't got as much experience, obviously, as, as people beyond my year. So I think sometimes for me, it's really important to remember that and, and try and, you know, go with what I've got and the experience that I've got. Um, because it is really easy, I think, especially because I hadn't been to university. So all of my friends mm. it, as well have all kind of, uh, you know, everyone's a lot older than me in my life kind of thing. So it's I, sometimes I actually forget that I am still 23 and that, um, <laughs> you know. I, I only passed my driving test how many years ago? So, um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I, um, yeah, I think I need to always remind myself of that because I can get a bit carried away and a bit competitive. I like the idea, the image of you sitting down with, I don't know, Carlos Sainz and reminiscing about, you remember when the Soviet Union collapsed and, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, just good things you would have remembered being the same age as good old yeah. Carlos Sainz. <laughs> It's, uh, I, I like that idea of the competitiveness note. But on, on a similar note, I'm wondering, because you are certainly young relative to you know, whatever category it is, and regardless of how young you are relative, still when you're new, you went straight into the European category, as we said. Did you find you were approaching things differently to some of the guys who might have been there for a long time? Because it always interests me. There are always drivers who arrive from different generations and, and change the game a bit or raise the bar in some way that others haven't considered. Given that you are still only, I guess, a couple of years into your career, which is incredible to think, but are you finding that some of those changes you're generating yourself now, I guess you're not learning from other people as much as you are forging your own path? I think it's been a kind of shift for me this year. So before... To be honest with you, when I was driving in the European Championship, I didn't have the budget to be there. So I was literally running on my teammate's secondhand tyres. So he would come in from a, a few stages loop, he'd take his tyres off, which were going to be going in the bin for him. And they'd go on my car as new tyres because I just like, I wanted to be there so much, but I didn't have the full budget. So I wasn't testing. I didn't have, um, you know, this excess tyre budget. I didn't have everything basically apart from the essentials of being there. I was always still a bit short, but I always made, made it happen somehow. Um, and so I think for me, it was never... I was never in a situation where I was like, oh, go hell for leather and throw the car at the scenery. And if it doesn't work out, it doesn't work out. Because I didn't have the budget to pick up the bill. But, you know, mm. if I crashed, it meant I wouldn't be at the next race. So for me, it was a lot more of a kind of calm and steady approach, which was always sort of drilled into me that, you know, just get the experience, get the kilometers. I would never be pushing so much that I thought, I mean, obviously I'd crash cars, but that's part of the learning process of it. And if you aren't crashing, then you're not going fast enough at the beginning. So um, it was, it was. But I think that's always the case in rally. You always have a few big crashes and they kind of mellow you out. Um, and so I had, I did have some big crashes, but actually I never, I, I never went in with the attitude of, you know, like, oh, I've got, you know, millions and millions, it doesn't matter what happens because I can I can write the car off and be at the next race. Um, and I know that a lot of drivers, when they're coming up, you know, they have quite a lot of budget and they're able to really commit to it and not think about anything else. Whereas that was always in the back of my head. Um, and so I think for me, that was probably the limiting factor on that. And it wasn't a case of kind of me being fearless in it. It was more, a lot more of, you know, I felt a lot of kind of responsibility for the way that I drove from that sense. Um, I think going into Extreme E now is a bit different because um, I think because it's a new championship and it's a new setup for everyone. It's not like some teams have got 10 or drivers have got 10 years experience in this. They know this is how you win a race. I think everyone can come at it from different angles. And, you know, me and Timmy have chats all the time of how we can try and find the edge. And, you know, we worked so hard, especially um, in, in Senegal and Greenland to try and, um, you know, get to the top of the ladder. So I think it's it's cool to have fresh eyes on it sometimes as well, because, um, you know, I think every driver will bring in something different that the others haven't thought about or haven't seen um, in some way. So um, I think sometimes I'm like my engine because obviously I haven't had that much experience in in um as as, as the other guys in, in competition so sometimes you know for example the engineering stuff Timmy's really experienced and that he's developed his own cars with Peugeot to win championships and world rally cross mm. whereas I, I'll come in from a different side of you know this is my experience from in rally which he might not have because he hasn't been on this you know Finland gravel stage or whatever it might be so there's always something different that we can bring to each other and I don't necessarily come from the engine engineering point point but I think I've got a really strong feeling for the car and like how it's handling so if I can vocalize that and he can then try and translate that and it's, it, it becomes a bit of a, a union of how we can build a, a car that's you know good and that can handle the terrain that we're on. Katie you mentioned that pe different people in this in Extreme E specifically but bring different sort of backgrounds and 
areas to their training, perhaps, uh, to the track itself. And Michael and I are very interested in sports psychology. We find, find it both very interesting. We know now certainly a lot of drivers, of course, are doing a lot of strength training and conditioning for endurance or from, you know, Formula One or whatever it might be. But the mental side, that sort of mental performance is something that hasn't really been focused on a lot. But now it's really becoming more of a thing. It's becoming more necessary, isn't it, if you want to become stronger as a team, as you said, with yourself and Timmy, of course. But how much of a mind game is sport from your point of view? And especially something like rallying too, which is so much about being able to respond very quickly and have that really exceptional mental agility. Yeah, it's massive. And it's something that I probably focus on more than any other kind of training, to be honest with you. Um, I think when I was starting out, and, and still, to be honest with you, still joining a new championship, you can get quite overwhelmed with it. Um, and it's really important, actually, because it affects things like your sleep, it affects your focus, mm. um, it affects your confidence. Um, if you're not in a good headspace, then actually it can really, you know, it has a way of having a real effect over your weekend. And I think sometimes people don't realise how much of a power it actually has over you. You can be the fittest person in the world, but if you're not, you know, calm and relaxed, you, you're you going to make bad decisions. Um, mm. And I think that was the biggest thing for me. When I started Rally, I always thought you have to be so fired up, you have to be aggressive, you have to be all of these things to be able to do well in a car because it's kind of you know, that stereotypical motorsport, hardcore music sort of thing. And actually, <laughs> I realized that I performed, <laughs> I performed a lot better when I was calm, relaxed and sort of just you know, like this, I've, I've got it. I've got some skills behind the wheel somewhere in me and my like, you know, <laughs> neural connection. So I've just got to trust it. And when I actually took that approach and I think Timmy's really like that. So he's really been a big influence on me this year in my sort of learning of how to cope with big events. Um, so he's, he is mega. He's like, I don't, I don't know how to describe him. He's like some Buddhist, a Buddhist kind of walking around the service park. He's got this like really chilled persona. If anyone knows him, he's, if anything's going wrong, he's just very methodical, very logical. Um, and so I've taken a, like a, a kind of big lesson out of his book this year, and especially with problem solving, which obviously we're doing a lot of in a new championship with a new car. It's kind of a, a big um, kind of learning process for everyone. Um, and so I've taken some steps like breathing techniques that I've been working with my sports psychologist on. Um, I think I think there's a lot of different things that sound stupid but you just have to like one of the one of the techniques that we used before is like thinking about your stress bucket bucket so if you're if you're stressed anyway and then you're going to be stressing yourself out at some point you're just going to overfill which is true and I think we all know that in life you have to have some vices that like drain the stress and help you to deal with um, what you're faced with because um, I was reading this study and it said somewhat that if you're stressed that you make you, the decisions you make in split seconds which you're bearing in mind you have to think about that from a racing sense so should I irritate should I go flat out over that jump those, all those sort of things that are happening really quickly in your brain you make poorer decisions when you're stressed when you're kind of fired up when there's more cortisol in your body so or already you're going to be in that state because you're going to have race nerves so you don't want to keep filling that up from other points so it's stuff like listening to music is one of my things that helps me relax um and reading and, and meditating and all of these things actually in Greenland I had quite a lot of time to do that because we got there a bit early so I was on the boat so I, I got up I did a morning meditation on the decks took my yoga mat um <laughs> and so I actually really noticed a big difference though in the weekend because I felt a lot more like myself you know when, when I'm at home and the way that I handle problems I felt like I kind of took that with me rather than just letting my head spin into, you know, race week, which is really easy to do. And probably good also that you didn't end up with Sarah camping on the ice thinking that everyone was doing it. In fact, it was just... <laughs> I couldn't believe that because we just walked onto the ice cap and we saw them there. And I was like, oh, how are you? I haven't seen you yet. She's like, we literally slept in it. And I've been on it for 10 minutes. And I was like, I'm too cold. I can't do it. And, I just, oh. and only that, it she slipped over in, in some running water and was as cold for the rest of the night for that too. I mean, that's, uh, we spoke about it in her episode. Just really, really exceptional stuff. Anyway, very funny. We'll get back to our chat with Katie Munnings in just a moment. But of course, over the course of the last couple of episodes and for the next few, we've been hearing from Professor Lucy Woodall, who's from the Extreme E Science Committee. We've been talking to her about, of course, the climate change impacts more generally, but in specific, those that were affecting the environments around Sardinia for the Island X Pre. In this part of our chat, we talked to her about a word you probably heard more than once, microplastics, what exactly they are, how they're affecting the ecosystems and why we should be doing more to try and eliminate them from the environment. Lucy, you mentioned 
bottled water there and we know that across the world plastic pollution specifically uh, is a big issue and indeed uh, for our second stop for Extreme E at the Ocean X Pre in Senegal uh, we saw plenty of that too with uh, of course teams and the full crew of Extreme E picking up plastic along the beach there but can you tell us about microplastics and where they fit into this picture? Yeah, of course. Um, so actually I've done quite a lot of work on microplastics. Um, I, my first foray into this area was not on purpose. It was completely by accident. I was looking for small worms in mud off seamounts and seamounts are like little mountains in the ocean that haven't stuck their heads up above the sea. Um, about a week's sailing out of South Africa. Okay, so somewhere super remote. And I did find these little little worms, nematodes, but actually I found way more of these red, blue, green little fibers, uh, which we now know as microplastics. And indeed that paper and subsequent work showed that indeed microplastics really are ubiquitous. Um, and I think this is a really good message for us across the planet to think about our impacts that we're having. Impacts from microplastics can be both physical and chemical from the chemicals that are both in the microplastics and the physical um, contribution of them um, when they get ingested. Um, and their impacts really are still being quantified. But what I'd say is that microplastics themselves are actually only part of the story. Because just yesterday, um, I was co-author on a paper that looked at how climate change and plastics are tightly linked. And this is important for two aspects. It shows us where these two global challenges are tied together, but also it helps us understand that these two really challenging threats sometimes thought as competitive. Where do we put our resources? Where do we even put our brain power as humans? Um, and it's really important that we don't see them as competitive issues, but actually as really integral to each other. Because as we've already spoken about, you know, it's, it's that overuse of resources by some of us that has contributed to both of these challenges. So let me just go through where these two maybe quite disparate ideas are really linked. So plastic contributes to climate change through the production of greenhouse gases, and that's from their production all the way through to their end and their disposal. And it's actually estimated about 10% of the carbon budget to come from plastic. Now, I'm just gonna tell you about production right now, just in the sake of time, but about 3% um, of emissions comes from the production of plastics alone. And that's quite a lot if you think around food production, maybe as 10%. Um, fossil fuel, um, from which most plastics are made, causes the release of very potent greenhouse gases, methane. Um, and then you've got things like land clearance for refineries um, who make the precursors to plastics which of course themselves um, need a huge amount of energy to produce those chemicals. So now we've got one aspect that is tightly linked with the production of greenhouse gases um, and hence the cause of climate change. Um, but we've also kind of the other way spoken around the increases of extreme weather events. And the, this um, extreme weather can have an increased spread and movement of plastic uh, flow and leakage into natural environments. So, for example, the melting of, of Arctic ice, um, which is a sink of microplastics, will cause the re-release of this pollutant back into the environment. And of course, increase in storms creates sediment resuspension. We've all seen that on a windy day on the beach. Um, and that sea spray that we can feel on our faces um, both uh, redistributes plastics back into the atmosphere and back onto land. Um, and more clear to see is the additional pollution of plastic items um, when they're mismanaged. Um, if there's flooding from storms, uh, and of course, this is more likely under climate change. 
That was Professor Lucy Woodall from the Extreme E Scientific Committee. We'll have another bit of a chat with her in next uh, in the next episode of the podcast, talking more about the science behind Extreme E and the challenge of climate change. But for now, let's get back into our chat with Katie Munnings from Andretti United. Katie, I want to talk about your television experience because uh, this is something that was is a little close to my heart because my favourite band growing up was The Darkness. And all these years ago, I saw that Justin Hawkins had released this thing saying, oh, we've just put together this soundtrack for this new show, Katie's Amazing Machines. And I was like, that's a bit random for a glam rock band to be putting a soundtrack (laughs) together for this show. But, of course, there you were. And it was obviously amazing music, of course it is. But in terms of that whole experience for you, how did that happen and what was it like, I suppose, being on this side of the camera and this side of the microphone? I was really trying to get that song to be my ringtone for ages. I just thought it'd be hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> never managed though. And do you know what? I was gutty because when I left that show, I never met them. And then when I left that show, I saw the, the new presenter. She was like backstage at their concert and they oh. were touring with Johnny Depp. And, uh, and oh. I was like, oh no, oh. this is so gutty. So, um, Justin, I'm if so you're fun. listening, please DM Katie and just please. get some <laughs> tickets to Glastonbury or something. Um, she yes. would love to be backstage, of course. <laughs> <laughs> so that was a cool um that was a cool one actually because it came out of nowhere um i i just did an interview on bbc breakfast which is like a, a kind of breakfast tv show in the uk um off the back i won the ladies trophy in the european championship so i was just kind of chatting to them about what it was like driving in the european championship and the producer from kids tv was watching i think um and he came up with this idea where he wanted it to be like um a kind of top gear but for kids um with a female presenter because obviously um, you know, a lot of shows like that are presented by males. So he mm. wanted to have a female. And I I kind of went along to the pilot and we filmed this in, in this monster truck. And I was like, well, this is crazy. But they were sort of saying to me, normally this sort of show will get two, take two years to be commissioned. So I wasn't expecting anything. Um, and then I had a call about a month later saying that um, it's been fast tracked because they really think it's an important message to be getting out there now to kids at this age. Wow. Um, they were saying something like, by the time you're five, most like 90% of your perception of how the world is, is already developed. So they really wanted to drill it into kids that you can be anything you want to be regardless of whether you're a boy or a girl Um, and so I was up for it um, and I started filming a big reason of why I started filming was to get some more budgets that I could drive more rallies so that was kind of why I was like (laughs) this is cool because it's raising my exposure but I could also put this whatever I earn from TV I can put it back into my racing so it was it was a mental few months because I had to film basically every single day that I wasn't driving in the European Championship because they also had a deadline so Mm. I'd be coming back I'd be flying back in from Rally Grand Canaria and I'd literally be on like a, a whatever submarine it was the next day and trying to remember my lines and <laughs> it got to the end where I did have a bit of like a wow I can't take anymore because I was trying to remember rally routes in my head from watching hours and hours of onboard footage and I was trying to remember lines and I'd stand on set and I just wouldn't be able to remember anything and I'd just be stood there like my brain was complete mush and um my mum actually she's a makeup artist for tv so i managed to get her on the job with me so we would travel together awesome. and she would help drive me and answer my emails and stuff while i was on set and um yeah she, i remember her looking at me and being like you can't do this again um and so the next year it, it was sad because it got commissioned for another couple of years but um i wanted to focus on my racing which is obviously why i'd become you know come to have the opportunity of the tv anyway so i wanted to give that a proper shot um and so we kind of made that decision to fully commit because i knew in my heart, I'd just be half doing both if I went with it. So, mm-hmm. um, yeah, they've, they're still running, I think. I think they're on Series 5 or something like that. So long as you get backstage for the darkness, really, that will just close that <laughs> off as a win. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, exactly. It's all worth it. What And what a beautiful, like, full circle story that is because to think that all perceptions are, or 90% of perceptions before you're age five, crashed your first car at age two, well, not a car really, <laughs> but, you know. It's all working out. It's all working It's going well. Even probably <laughs> studying and rallying prepared you to do TV and rallying. Who would have thought? All those years ago. <laughs> yeah, yes. It's all worked out perfectly. Hey, just before we get into the Extreme E stuff in particular, uh, one of the first videos I think I saw when Extreme E started popping up was, I don't know why this was fed to me necessarily by the Instagram algorithm, but was <laughs> Prince William in uh, Extreme E car <laughs> with you <laughs> and Alejandro, of course. Just... Uh, what is that like? I mean, you because you did rally instructing as well, right? As part with with the the business with your dad as well, and you've got experience in that now. Generally speaking, is it different when, let's say, it's precious cargo in a more political or grander world sense next to you when you're trying to like talk them through how to control the beast that is the Odyssey? 
Yeah, exactly. And um, because I've done, I've done some rally instruction where I've been, you know, slow down. <laughs> so I haven't had different controls in the rally car. I've been like, I used to instruct for years at a, and on basically a stage of Wales Rally GB, which is like really narrow, drops you mm. the side, um, and it's very dangerous sort of places to drive. And we didn't have dual controls in the car, uh, dual controls in the car. Mm. So the only way I would have of controlling people was to just shout basically. And sometimes this red mist comes over someone where they they realize they're not braking and then they freeze and then they don't break and then nothing you say will get through to them so I'm kind of grabbing the handbrake and so I, I have been in situations like that in the past and I didn't obviously I didn't know with any driver I didn't know how you how they're going to drive so it was exactly the same going into this um and we kind of started on a lower power and it was fine obviously it was quite easy to control and everything but he's really into cars and he's actually a really good driver so of course he was like wanting to see what it was capable of so Alejandro did some laps with him and then I jumped in and we turned the power up and I did sort of a demo lap and he was like now we're talking and I was like well do you want to have a go obviously um he was excited that it was higher power he's like yeah yeah okay and then I got out and I was thinking oh my goodness this is like this is what we race with now this is fast um, and I obviously this he'd done one lap and I was I wasn't sure how he was gonna take it um and then he was yeah he was absolutely flying he was like trying to find the limit he was breaking later into chicanes and he was touching the rear on these like tire walls and stuff and I was thinking god how do I how if if it comes to the point where you know he missed just a breaking or anything how do I say that <laughs> so it was just uh, it, was, it was one of these moments in my life where I was like I've never been in this situation before and I'll probably be ne- never be in this situation again and the whole of extreme is basically trusting me to keep him safe in the car and because it was it was the first so yeah it was just a real surreal sort of pressure that I felt but also we were having so much fun because he was just like chatting to me about the cars that he used to drive when he was growing up and and when he was a kid and um because he's really into motorbikes as well so we were having like really normal chats and then I was thinking okay I just wanted I just kind of wanted to make sure that we weren't going to crash the whole way through that was like my baseline but he was really good and I was completely chilled with it and he was the actually the one that said okay I've had enough now so that was good because normally it's the other way and somebody wants more and more and more and you know how close they're getting to the limit and you think oh like I'm a bad passenger anyway I'll sit you know I'll sit with Timmy because it's great for us and and kind of kind of like our testing and how much we learn because we don't get a lot of seat time in the car but I really don't want to be on that side of the car I much prefer being in control (laughs) <laughs> I was I was really happy when he got out of the car and he'd had a good time and he was safe. That was like, okay, mission accomplished for me. Good episode of The Crown though coming up, I imagine. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it writes itself, really. It writes itself. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I, can only, I can only imagine how you were feeling at the time. And then, of course, you were thinking about rally stages and probably somewhere in there was like, what was that question again for the A-levels and just thousands of things going through your mind probably all at once. Now, let's talk about Extreme E. We probably should. It is the Extreme E podcast. Now, the first question I have is how you got the call because we know Molly Taylor was kind of randomly contacted by Nico Rosberg through some kind of like website email that no one had ever used and she thought someone was having a bit of a laugh. Was Zach Brown kind of doing something similar to you in that respect? Because it, it must must have been pretty overwhelming to to have been given the call. Yeah, do you know what? It was quite unexpected because I'd been chatting to Extreme for a few months. This is not the teams. This is just pure Extreme mm. Um, because they were creating this driver pool, which they were kind of creating incentives for teams to pick drivers from and within their driver pool. So it was a big selection of different drivers. Um, and uh, there, you didn't really have any commitments by entering into it. But I didn't, to be honest with you, I did not believe Extremely would happen because the first calls, they were sort of saying, it's a cargo ship, it's going to travel to the Amazon, we're going to offload, you're going to race there, then we're going to save the Amazon. Like there were so many things that were coming up and I was thinking, how is that How is that actually going to run? Like logistically, we were in, in the middle of the pandemic um, and they they were sort of saying, oh, we're going to be going to places in Greenland that people haven't been before and they haven't raced before. And and I was thinking this just sounds like it sounds cool, but we have seen a lot of electric championships kind of come up and then and then fade mm. as well within the season. So I wanted to be careful what I committed to because, I, you know, obviously I was thinking about my career as well. And after a few calls with them and I, I had this feeling that I really wanted to do it. And I was sort of saying to my family and to my agent as well, I was like, I really like I, re- I can feel it in my tummy. This sounds really exciting. Um, and so they've had a lot more of the conversations about, you know, how the logistics of it would run and and the team that was behind Extreme and they were they were then convinced as well. So I was like, well, this sounds, uh, you know, I'm up for it. So we kind of entered into the driver's pool. I, I didn't know what would happen. And this is really early on. So I think this is before 
any of the teams like Rosberg before X44, before quite a lot of them. I think me and Timmy were like the second drivers to be announced in the championship. I think Sarah Price and Carla G came before us. But apart from that, I think there was like three teams that we knew about at that time. And so um, I had, yeah, so Roger Griffiths, who's the Formula E team principal for Andretti. Um, I just got, I think it was a phone call off him or I got an email on a Friday night because of the time difference. So he's based in LA. Mm. So I was like having a classic lockdown barbecue with my family. <laughs> and um, he, he phoned me. I, he texted me and he was like, are you free to chat? And he phoned me straight away. And then I was kind of in this strange scenario. Was on, I was in the middle of lockdown and we hadn't had sort of any work stuff going on, if you know what I mean. So races mm. had kind of been suspended. So nobody really knew where they were. And then I was talking about this full on championship that was going to be happening next year. And, and it was really exciting. And then, so yeah, I was, I really liked the vibe of the team. Um, I didn't know my teammate would be Timmy. So um, it was the, the whole way through actually until it, it was almost announced that we were driving. I didn't know it was Timmy. So we'd both signed the contract before they told us. I think they did that because they wanted to make sure that we were signing, you know, because we wanted to be with the team and that we didn't, yes. we weren't going to turn around and say, oh, I don't like him. <laughs> um, which I would definitely have done now if it was Timmy. <laughs> I'm joking. Sure. I'm so glad I'm he's amazing. He's the best teammate. Yeah, we keep calling him my brother now because I basically just follow him and his brother around the world racing. So yes. <laughs> I'm the third yes. sibling. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it was, it was like that. And so we'd both, me and Timmy had both signed up before any of the other teams. So when I saw, you know, obviously all of the Formula One drivers then getting involved, it was like, okay, cool. So they believe in it too. Because at the time we were all sort of taking a gamble. Everyone was taking a gamble on the early days and we didn't know how it would turn out. So uh, I was, I felt happy to have been, you know, kind of in there from the beginning and then kind of watching it all unfold and seeing who my competitors would be. Awesome. Look, and just on that with Timmy as well, uh, of course, uh, you, and you sort of mentioned it already, in rallying, you obviously have a co-driver, but you're driving. This is a unique situation because you're both sharing driving duties. You've got a 50-50 split right down the middle with this one. Is that a mental adjustment? I mean, you already said being a passenger is kind of hard. Luckily, you don't have to be a passenger here, but you're literally out of the car for some of this race. <laughs> Yeah, it is. It's very different. And I actually, when I when I first, uh, when we first signed, I think the format would be that we would co-drive each other. So I was expecting him to co-drive for me and then I would co-drive for him. Um, and I, I I know that a lot of drivers don't like being passengers, so I'm sure that's probably why <laughs> it didn't actually run like that. Um, but I was really up for that because I'd obviously come in from rally. I'd never been on a, in a car on my own. And he was the opposite. So he'd never had someone mm. in the car. So when we had our first test day, we were at Walters Arena in Wales. And this is the first time we'd seen the car and the team and everything. And we were testing. So we only had a few laps because um, it was limited by the championship. So me and Timmy sat in for both. And he was saying, I've never had someone in the car with me. This feels really strange to have someone like talking through an intercom to me when I'm driving. And I said, it just feels completely normal to me because this is how I normally compete. And then at the end, we were getting out because obviously we wanted to see the kind of weight distribution of one of us in a car at the same time. And I was like, oh, I don't like that. I was kind of getting separation anxiety because I like having someone <laughs> in the car with me, uh, you know, co-driving and talking through setup and stuff. So it was a bit of an adjustment from my side. I think from him, it's kind of normal because he still has an engineer in his ear, which is the kind of, you know, he has a spotter in rally so it's not that different um, and now it's not that different for me either because I've still got kind of connection with the engineer in my ear telling me what's happening as well so it's not that different but at the beginning I was really up for having you know having two drivers in the car at the same time um, but yeah he's such a big support to me we have so much fun on the race weekend so I'm really glad that we're staying together next year in the team um, that was like the biggest thing for me is you know who's your teammate going to be because are you going to get on with them that's such a massive thing sharing a car sharing a setup you know, even down to sharing a seat. There's so many things that you have to kind of compromise on and find mm. middle ground. And he's just really easy to work with. And, you know, his family's a really lovely family too. So I'm super happy that I've got him as my teammate. And brother, as you say, your Instagram photos from this week were hilarious. You're just following the Hanson brothers around. Hello, I'm now here. I now belong I to this crowd. I just keep showing up. Yeah. <laughs> I did yeah, that that's... actually in um, February this year. So I'd met him like a couple of times. And then um, we went to Dubai um, and we were training in the sand. And then this was kind of when England was really difficult to train in because of the lockdowns and stuff. So instead of coming back here, I went and rented a flat in his town where he lives, this kind of small town. Um, <laughs> And I was like, hey, I'm here now. <laughs> so I stayed there for a few weeks and his wife would make me pizza because they've got this amazing pizza. But actually, Timmy's really, if you ever have him on here, 
ask him about pizza and you won't have to say another thing for the whole <laughs> honestly I'll see him like we'll be sat on the bus on the way to the truck and he'll be scrolling through Instagram and I'll be like looking at his phone and it will literally be like different doughs that they're making in Italy and it's like he travelled he made his family travel like three hours across Sweden to go to a pizza restaurant and then travel back he's so he's like they he does like, really really good pizza but that's his thing like I arrived at his house for this dinner party and he was like okay Come in, but um, just to let you know, I'm not angry with you. I get really angry at the pizza when I make the pizza if it doesn't go right. And he's like full in like apron that everything was sorted. It's all laid out. He's got all the doughs that he's been, whatever you do to doughs all day to make them perfect. And I just sort of stood there and watched and he was just throwing it around. And he got, he's really good at it. He got really into it. Um, I think he's happy now because it was broken over the summer, but I've heard that his pizza oven is fixed now. So I'm sure he's going to be getting some of that when we get back <laughs> from the races. Like well, maybe when there's more hey, of a... I didn't realise, because you said after winning in Greenland, you'd learned a lot from him. Does that mean the pizza? Is that what you're talking about? Yeah, <laughs> yeah literally. So, you know, earlier I was talking about like stress techniques and things like that. This is it. <laughs> so for him, it's pizza. Like 100% <laughs> of his relaxation is just pizza, I think. <laughs> I yeah, if it goes seeing... wrong, 100% of the bucket is just full of pizza dough. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. I look forward to seeing the Hanson Pizza Company sort of like a stall popping up at the extreme e-paddock next year. We start seeing it's like, oh, this is at least said to be some decent. Oh, he's shouting at it. It's not gone well. We might come back in a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> but I'd be the hey. first customer. It was the best pizza I've ever had. Yeah. <laughs> It's Katie, definitely I want to talk- a novel way to go sponsorship, I suppose, isn't it? Sponsor Ooh, yourself yeah. with your own pizza business. <laughs> yeah, we spoke about point. this and I said, what are you going to do when you retire from racing? And this is one of the things that came up. We were saying, well, you've got a huge market for it. Open up a restaurant. <laughs> <laughs> well, look, I mean, now you've given it enough of a plug now that if he doesn't do it, I think people will be disappointed. <laughs> from me, yeah. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Uh, I want to talk to you a little bit about the the way that Extremely was set up, of course, because you did mention then before, of course, that uh, you would there's two drivers in the car, one female female, one male. And that is an interesting concept, isn't it really? Especially as you had just you know, won at 18 years of age after a year of rallying the ladies in European championship. It seems to be a completely different world ago now, doesn't it? That we were having specific categories for that. And now, you know, Alejandro's idea of saying, well, that, that this has to happen. I mean, it's, it's a no brainer really, isn't it? That you get two people in the car that can perform exceptionally well. And of course we saw uh, in all of the races, how you know much jeopardy that throws into it as well, because some people are talented from depending what um, motorsport category they come from. Gender had really has nothing to do with it. But how is that important for you, especially you know, being 23? And I don't mean to bring up your how young you are all the time, of course. But from a from a point of view of those younger people looking up to you, both male and female, it doesn't really matter in terms of that sense. But how is it important is it for you? I suppose being at this point of uh, motorsport history where this is the first series to make sure that this is a thing and how important do you think that's going to be for for leading the way? I think it's definitely a privilege. I think that's the biggest thing is like from all sides really, It's a, obviously it's a privilege to race against names that I've kind of grown up in rally following and obviously watched F1 on TV as well. But I think for more from like the competition side, I feel super lucky because um, it puts, it gives us a platform to really see where we're, we're at in terms of pace. Um, and so I don't think there's many people that can say, oh, we've sat in the same car as Carlos Sainz, as Loeb, as Button, as, as Hansen, and we've actually know where we're at. So I've obviously obviously raced in, in races before as we all do it's a small world you know load might be in the top car in the top category and I'll be in the junior car so you you have no idea really what the step is then to to being as fast as you know eight-time world rally champion and I think um actually to to have this platform now where we're able to sit on the same in the same cars and say actually okay I mean, I mean I, it kind of hit me when we did our first test in Wales and Timmy was like well you're faster on that corner there than me and I, and it was one of those moments where I thought this is this is so cool for you for, for me you know as an up-and-coming driver to be able to compare my data and to compare my lap times to these legends of our sport that have got real pace and I can mm. actually learn so much from this and so he's looking at my data and saying okay I'm going faster on that corner there because you were faster around that hairpin I'm looking at his and saying okay you're flat out over that crest I'm not and I think actually from a driver development point even if you not that I'd want to because I absolutely love it even if you took extreme away and then put these drivers back in the field as to where they were all coming from before I think there would be a lot of improvement especially from the female side and that's not nothing to do with gender but I think on the whole 
the females have got less experience in the championship mm. than the males, obviously, because, you know, we've got some uh, top kind of rally legends in there from the male side in Formula One as well. And we haven't got that from the females because they haven't been, you know, recently in, in recent years, they haven't been at that, at that level. So I actually think it's a real kind of privilege for me to be able to to, to see that. And I think we saw that mostly in Greenland in, in um, the, the times and stuff when we were looking at it. And there was no segregation between the girls and the guys. And I think that's what's really exciting is that it's, it's not like the girls are, you know, way back you have a split and then you have the girls um you know i think i had this conversation with Lobe actually after the race in greenland and he was saying wow we were coming up to the first corner i had katie on one side i had molly on the other and it's you know it's different it's different for the guys as well i'm sure but it's it's exciting then because then then it mm. becomes about racing and we don't have to keep talking about the girl drivers and the guy drivers because inevitably we'll get to the point where it will just be sort of one field obviously we're all still learning and we're all still developing our skills especially from my side as well because i haven't got as much experience as, as most the drivers in the championship but actually to be learning on this level is like a real fast track and so I think that's what has for me that's been like the biggest thing from my career is to actually have access to that and then have the same you know as I was talking earlier I don't have to worry about running on secondhand tires and all of these things because it's a very different <laughs> setup here so I think from like a sporting side it's been the biggest thing for me in my career to actually put me on the same level and give me the opportunity mm. to learn in the same way that they are mm, so good just picking up on that idea of the analysis and stuff, and I want to talk about Greenland now because, of course, we should talk about Greenland now. That that win, I thought it was interesting earlier on in the weekend, I think you said something like you sort of felt like a good result was coming. It felt like things were kind of coming together for you guys. This is still a new series, as you mentioned there. Everyone's still sort of learning the car and, of course, exactly how the format's working. What does it mean now to put it together, a weekend together in Extreme E? Did it feel like you'd sort of nailed the sport if you like that's not overstating it too much or did it just feel like you sort of just did a better job at a time when everyone's still trying to find their way yeah I think it was a, it was so Senegal was kind of the polar opposite for us we really struggled that weekend um we really struggled with our feeling and and it was just one of those ones where I felt like a bit of an uphill battle we weren't really moving in the right direction and it, it was you know, we were learning a lot so that we took the positives from that. And obviously we we kind of stopped on stage in the first qualifying. And at that time, the, the f- race format meant that we, there was no chance of us progressing into the final because we could only make it into the shootout race to determine the last kind of three positions. So in terms of affecting the overall result for the rest of the weekend, it, we kind of, it, you know, it didn't, it was obviously we wanted to do as well as we could, but it was a bit irrelevant because we weren't going to be in the final. So in terms of using it as a test for us to understand more about the car and more about how we work as a team, it was really positive. And so we took took what we'd kind of learned from there and then we tried to put it into race pace on Greenland from the beginning so that we would be in a situation where you know and even in Greenland on Q1 we stopped on track um, and we lost some time so it, this was but then to think we would we would win was, wasn't what we were kind of thinking until we got further into the weekend and as we were looking at it we had so so me and Timmy were both fast on our Q1 time so we were happy with our pace I think he got the super sector as well in, in the first run of the weekend so that was really cool um, and then Q2, um, we just saw like a lot of issues were happening for other people. So it was, I think a little bit of it was a kind of lottery um, and a bit of luck on our side as well. But we kind of said, OK, let's take an easy run and we could, you know, finish qualifying quite well. And we ended up actually in, in the hardest semi-final, I would argue, because we had some really competitive teams around us. So we were in semi-final two, which is, I think, second, third and fourth overall from qualifying. So um, really competitive um, race. And yeah, me and Timmy, we just had a really great run again and we were able to win that and I think we got ourselves into the headspace of um, being really kind of quite confident with where we were we found a setup that we enjoyed and that we felt confident driving on that surface and I think that was the biggest thing as well for from a confidence side to push in the car obviously we haven't had a lot of seat time to be we don't know exactly how the car will be all the time so it takes quite a lot to drive at 100% um, and so I think that setup actually made a massive difference to in terms of how much we felt like we could just go for it in that moment um and then I think there was another side of it, which was just, yeah, feeling like just, and I remember he kept saying it to me, we didn't really want to say it because we didn't want to jinx it, but he was like, as we were getting towards the semis and he was like, we can win this. And we'd sort of say it and then brush it aside and be like, okay, so what do we have to do now then? How are we going to put that plan into motion? And at the end of the weekend, I just like, my mum said, oh, I felt you were going to win. And I was like, I know I did too. Like I really felt like we had, or at least we were going to have a good result that weekend. And then I spoke to our team manager and I was sort of saying, oh, I just had this feeling we would win it. And he said he had a good omen when we walked to the track that morning, he'd been out running or something and he'd lost his sunglasses. And then he went out again in the morning and he'd seen them. Someone had put them 
um, literally outside the front door of his hotel. So he's like, that's a good omen for the day. It's going to be a good day. And then we won. So I think sometimes it is just a bit of that coming into play. Like all the stars are aligned in some way um, for us that weekend. And it almost felt easier then. It didn't feel like so much of a, a, it wasn't a, a fight from that sense. It felt like we were all moving through the weekend quite methodically. But in no way has, I don't think any team would say that they've mastered this sport yet because I think it's definitely a learning progress. And I think it's it's one of those things where you can always do better. I mean, we look back at our weekend and we say, well, we could have done better here. We could have done better there. I think that's just part of the process. But I think that's also what's so exciting about this championship in year one is that it's not sterile. There's no like winning formula. It's very different each weekend, each location even. All of the team has to work around that. The engineers have to figure out if the battery is going to be all right in this climate. And, and you know, the kind of the, the setup engineers are constantly dealing with different terrains, which I think is a real challenge in this championship. So, um, yeah, it's, it's step by step each weekend. But I think I've personally found a good place where I perform, I think, in terms of my mental side and the support that I have around me. I think it's the same for Timmy. You kind of nestle into the team a bit. Um, and I think that's mm. probably the biggest thing for us at the minute. Brilliant. And tell us about the atmosphere of obviously winning and the podium and such a unique, I mean, all the podiums are unique in this series, really, considering where they are, but in particular, the remoteness of Greenland, because I think we all remember really that first lap of the final where virtually everyone was trying to pile into one hairpin in that revised first sector. So people were already pretty worked up by the time we got to the podium. And I think on top of that, of course, again, to talk about the remoteness of Greenland, it was one of those rounds where everyone had to stay on the ship together, right? So what was it like, that that culmination of that weekend when you, of course, got to take that top step on the podium? Yeah, it was it was really surreal. I think even from just, you know, being in Greenland, walking on the ice cap and having conversations with the, with the scientists for hours on end on the first few days and even learning of like how the, the sh- shamanic way of Greenland and how the local people live. And it was really quite surreal then to actually be going into racing there um, and especially racing on an area where you can literally see the glacier and the ice sheet in the background. And then the water that's changing the track every day was the one that's coming off the glacier. So it depends mm. basically how hot it's been as to how much water was there and I remember them saying to us actually we'll have to change the track if there's like because they kept having these mass melts in during the day and kind of having chunks of ice fall off and it would create a tsunami and that would flow down the river and then it would kind of flood end up flooding the track so sometimes the track was underwater and they weren't sure literally day by day they were running as to whether we'll have to change but that was how kind of close we were, we were getting to the you know the message in that area I guess that was the point of us going um I've forgotten your question I've gone off on a tangent about melting ice I can't remember what you <laughs> <laughs> it's a good tangent though just the atmosphere of the event I mean I think you've sort of gone to it there right like it's a huge scale place it was and it was it was like really special it was funny because and then at the podium at the end you realize how little people are there as well because I think the town that we were racing in it only had 488 people and they didn't come to spectate <laughs> either so it was kind of literally just us and the crews and, and a few people at the podium so I was straight on the FaceTime to my parents and I was like wanting to share it to them they said it's so hard they've been to every race that I've ever done really and they said it's so hard because you'll be watching the TV coverage and they'll be so excited and then it will like cut and it will just go to like East Enders or whatever comes on in England and they said and then they're, <laughs> they're like wanting to take the TV because they're wanting to follow it um, and so I was uh, me and Timmy actually went for a dip in the glacier as well to celebrate that yes, one so did. Yeah, I mean, he did that earlier on in the week and I thought he was crazy. So he'd been in exactly the same spot. Him and Johan had been like Vikings, just like strolling in and they'd gone for <laughs> a swim. We'd all been saying, you're absolutely insane, we're not doing that. And then obviously we ended up doing it uh, for the for the shot, for the Insta. <laughs> you got to do it for the gram, right? Especially if you've just yeah. won for the first time. And you got to share yeah, it with everyone, it as good. you say. Although my suitcase was <laughs> minging when I got it back, some damp overall with like pond water on it. That's- <laughs> <laughs> it was not pleasant. Pond water and champagne. What a what a combo <laughs> that must be. And sweat, of course, as well. What a combo. Yeah. Well, talk to us about what's ahead of you because as we mentioned just before we started recording, you've just come back from the US. What was that series like? And we know, of course, as you said earlier, that you're confirmed for, for 2022 for Andretti United, which is very exciting, of course, for both of you. But what else can we expect for, for Katie for the rest of 21 and 2022? I don't know, to be honest. We'll see what comes up. Um, this year's I've been kind of filling um, my race schedule around what I kind of think will be good for me from a like a development point of view. As if from driving, you know, obviously I'm doing more racing stuff now with Extreme E, so I wanted to get some side-by-side kind of experience. So 
I went out with the Hansons and I did some rally cross with their team, which was really fun in the cross carts. Um, I also did a Baja rally, which I loved. So that kind of desert style rallying, I did that in Aragon. So no, no big sand dunes. I'm like, I'm training for that. But um, <laughs> me and Timmy were actually terrified at the beginning of the year. He's, we went out to Dubai and we had a co-driver from Dakar with us and we were training uh. for, because we'd never driven in sand before. And a lot of the field is mm. that's where they drive. And obviously our first like, two races were purely sand. So we wanted to get some experience. So we went to these sand dunes in Dubai and we thought oh, it'd be easy. You know, like we, we've driven for years and we both were so humbled instantly within like the first hour of trying to climb these massive mountains. I mean, they're so much bigger in, in real life to how they are on photos. We were having lunch and he was saying, I've never, I've been scared like twice in my life in a car. Once was doing the big gap jump that I do in Nitro Rallycross. And then once was this morning trying to get up a sand dune because you have to stay flat out and you don't know what's going to be on the other side. So you kind of cross oh. it kind of half committing, but you still need to be able to turn back. And it's a completely new skill. So I love doing that Baja anyway. It was more kind of gravel tracks. Um, and in the US, I actually followed Timmy again. Um, so <laughs> he didn't actually know that time though. I kind of organized that one for myself. So I'm getting a bit of independence. <laughs> um, and I went and did a Nitro Rallycross round, which was like in a side-by-side -side UTV, which was awesome. So I was against so cool. like UTVs are massive in America. It's a really big field mm. and, and we just don't really have them in Europe. And so to, to drive against those guys, who were completely dialed in those in those machines was really special so um, yeah I really enjoyed that and hopefully I'll get a bit of I really enjoy rallycross so hopefully a bit more of that and a bit of a mix next year I think it's really fun to keep it mixed rather than committing to a full series I'm really enjoying what I'm doing at the minute is kind of on the side of extreme for my sort of training and to keep me in the feeling of driving something awesome look and before we wrap this one up and thanks so much for being generous with your time as well the, the core message here we've touched on it a couple of times is of course sustainability that's why extreme e is racing it's why we're going to the places that we're going we've mentioned already the the side of greenland and and that really visceral experience of what is in some respects the heart of, of the climate change challenge that we're facing but I think it's really interesting. It's it's one of the many facets of, I guess, the climate change debate, if we can call it that, is that, of course, the younger you are, the more likely you are going to have to deal with the, the knock-on effects of, of the whole thing. Whatever happens, however the next steps happen, it's going to be the younger generations that are, that are going to deal with it. Uh, and you're certainly, despite feeling like you're the same age as Carlos Sainz, you are certainly <laughs> on the younger side of the extreme E, so you've certainly got that much more investment in it, I suppose, and in selling the message. How important is it to find a way to, I guess, give back for want of a, a better phrase, by no means saying that you haven't given back before, but it's so difficult sometimes, it feels overwhelming, the, the whole climate change thing to feel like there's so little we can do. How important has it been to find a way to continue to race, to express that side of yourself while also having this great benefit where Extreme E is doing something really positive? It's been massive for me. That's been like the, the sustainability side of, of this championship has sort of changed my life. I don't want to say cringy, but, it, you know, it really <laughs> has opened my eyes into the way that we kind of, our, our world runs. And I think this shows how easy it is or not easy because I know that, that a lot goes on behind the scenes to make extremely happen but I, I like you know we've created a really intense sporting format we've managed to attract some massive names in motorsport and we're able to put on a race now which is is actually giving something back so I'd always felt that my career was quite selfish in motorsport because I, I'd been having fun obviously I'd love what I was doing traveling around the world and racing in the European Championship and WRC but it had it, it, I think during the pandemic when that all stopped and the world kind of stopped you can't everyone I think kind of looked at their lives and thought okay well we've all seen that because people aren't commuting in, commuting in cities now you can see the mountains in the back of wherever it was in the Himalayas so I think it, it, we've all seen how quickly you can kind of put a stop to how the world was moving in a negative way and I think for extremely to rise at that time and then to be educating people but also to be not just like a, a science documentary that's boring to watch I think that's the key is that it needed to be you know something that was going to attract uh, an audience that wasn't looking for information on climate change so obviously we've created a big sporting format and we're using the voice that sport has so I think from that sense then I think within the championship I feel a big responsibility so I've been creating little vlogs that I've been putting out um which are sort of a lot more focused on what's actually going on and behind the scenes of extremely rather than racing because everyone can get that footage elsewhere obviously so um i think from my side and, and the scientists keep saying this to us when we have these lectures is is um 
um, you know, share, use your voice that you have as athletes. And of course, some of the people in the championship have got loads of followers um, and to, to be spreading the messages um, from that sense. And I, what I was happy about was I was quite aware that sometimes things like this come up and, and you do a photo with P, for PR and then you don't have involvement in it. But this is actually the complete opposite of that. Um, where you go on like, you know, three hour car car rides into, into Senegal, into the middle of the kind of yeah. um, the coastline. And we plant, They the, we hear from the locals who were planting a million trees and we help them plant them and then we get back on the bus, we get back at 10 o'clock at night and then we're, we're back in the car the next day. So I'm really happy that it's like that. Um, I know sometimes when you're there, you're like, oh, I want to be getting into race mode and it's really difficult to divide your attention onto that. But I think the stories that you always phone home about, the things that you've learned about the environment or the people that you speak and spoken to, like in Senegal when I was hearing that the, the employment or that have extremely have given through their sponsorship of planting these trees has actually led to families being able to send their children to school because they've had an income which they wouldn't so, have had during the pandemic. Yeah. Um, and, you know, listening to some of the scientists, I was speaking to Professor Carlos and he said it's extremely as open doors. He's been trying to get in contact with people to put on legacy programs in these areas that we've been focusing on. And he hasn't had a response. He hasn't been able to make contact. Whereas now Extremely have come in and obviously with the contacts and with the sponsorship and the exposure. And he said these products have happened. And he said he's been trying for 10 years in some cases to be able to make contact contact in those locations and so actually when you hear that and you hear okay these legacies are going on for five years after we've left it's like it feels like you're doing something and not it's not just talk so I think from my side I'm really happy and I know Timmy's the same he even put I think you can change the world on the top of his helmet um and I think everyone is kind of picking up on that and yeah I mean it's once in a lifetime experience is the places that we're traveling to so I'm just happy to be there and to experience that as well aside from the racing from Andretti United, that was Katie Munnings, winner, of course, in Greenland and undoubtedly hoping to return to the podium for the final race in the UK, the Jurassic X Pre. What a great chat. What a cool person. How great to have her involved in the series. And such an interesting story on how she ended up being in the series, being mm. a rally driver as well. Fantastic to to see that it, you don't have to start karting at four years old to be able to make it yes. into motorsport <laughs> if you decide that a little later on in life that this is the path that you want to go down, then there are opportunities for you. Uh, I mm -hmm. personally, though, of course, loved our little chat about the darkness. Hopefully one of the uh, the team <laughs> somewhere in the darkness's team is listening so we can get her backstage at one of their upcoming concerts. Mm, yes, and whether or not she has to race from one event over the Biglish Channel to get there and then get a grade for it, I suppose. <laughs> Which was, uh, I mean, an incredible. I mean, that is commitment, isn't it? Yeah, if you're absolutely. a racing driver, we talk about commitment. That is commitment. Yeah, well, if you ever thought you had any big problems in terms of showing up to your exams, think again because yeah. that was it. Get for real. Me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Have an accident, go back, <laughs> and then sit an exam, and then fly back again to see your mechanics fixing up your cars. No, look, fantastic chat, absolutely. As you said, a slightly happier time uh, ahead of the Sardinia race, which didn't uh, really turn out all that well for them. The one thing I will say, <laughs> though, is I was keeping a close eye on Timmy Hansen's uh, Instagram account just to see the kind of pizzas he was eating. Oh. Oh, yes. uh, and uh, last week he looked like a really good one. <laughs> suddenly race the rope. I was like, hmm, okay, well, if we uh, if we ever bump into him at the Jurassic X Pre, I'm like, Timmy, yes. pizza? <laughs> <laughs> I assume he brings his pizza oven with him. Portable. Surely. Must have, he must have a portable one. He's on the road enough. Surely, surely. Well, look, that was a fantastic <laughs> chat. There's plenty more to come, though, in this podcast series. In our next episode, ahead of the Jurassic X Pre, we talk with someone incredibly special, Michael. Oh, yes, the most special of them all. It's mm. the big boss. It's mm. Alejandro it's... Gag. Do you want to know about him, about how he set, why he set up this series, how he managed to do it? Well, we're, well I assume we're going to ask him about it. I intend to anyway. <laughs> Uh, it's gonna be it's gonna be a great chat. Uh, it's not so often I think that it does long form interviews, so I'm really looking forward to hearing from you. Yeah, fantastic to have you join us for this episode, for the previous episodes, and it will be fantastic to have you join us for that. Make sure you are subscribed to the podcast wherever you're listening, and indeed to Extreme Ease YouTube channel. You can find all of those links in the description below. But for for now, Michael, it is time to say goodbye. Really looking forward to chatting with Alejandro in a couple of weeks, and then. And of course, all of the action in the final round at the Jurassic X Pre. Can't wait to see you then.